Hi, welcome back to Power of Storytime. I'm Kate, the creative director of Calling Card Books and Z-Girls Press. And every Wednesday at noon Pacific time, we read from one of our books. We've been reading from Finding the Lost. So we do that every Wednesday at noon. And then some Fridays at 5 p.m. Pacific time, uh, we read and chat with authors as well. And today we are very lucky to have author Sean Minster with us. He's the author of What Goes Unseen and Other Tales from Afar. So <laughs> welcome, Sean. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Uh... Glad you liked the first half enough to want to hear the second half. Yeah, yeah. Last week we started the uh, the story "Girl on the Mountain," which kind of has a little bit of a Jungle Book feel, and uh, and we left off in a very, a very pivotal moment. So we'll uh, we'll get back to that. She had just Kelly had just uh, made a pact with the the two faced monkeys to try and defeat the <laughs> papa, and I, I, the floor director is making some very dramatic faces behind the camera, which is why uh -huh. I was laughing there. Um, but, but uh, I have some questions about this story, and I'm sure the floor director has some too. Um, so the, the last time, not last time, but the time before that, we read The Great Hodag Hunt, which is about kind of a local monster legend in your area. And then another one of the stories is about the Boogeyman, who's another kind of legendary monster. And then uh, two of the stories, Long Black Veil and What Goes Unseen, are kind of about um, monstrous people. So I wanted to ask, uh, what inspired you to write about so many monsters, and was it intentional, or was it just that they're kind of interesting anti-heroes? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say it was intentional, because I just kind of started writing stories, and I guess there's a lot of monsters in my head. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're just interesting creatures. Um, they're, because in a monster, you can just uh, pack so much power and mystery into a physical form, or ethereal, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, you, you can do so much with them, there's no rules to them, so it's, it's just kind of a, a giant canvas for making whatever you want. Um, and then it presents a very interesting um, dynamic, if, if there is the monster-hero dynamic, um, it, it kind of brings about, okay, what do you, you, if you have to face the monster, the monster's the full half of that, so how much is dictated by the monster rather than the hero? How much are they shaping the story? How much does the hero kind of become part of the monster entangled in the monster's ways? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, what's rubbed off at the end when all, all the dust settles? Uh, how much of the monster is left around? Yeah. Uh, how, how much of it is black and white and how much of it is gray, kind of, as far as yeah. good and evil goes? Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, that monsters really do add a lot of spice to the story, because they can kind of do whatever they want, so it can take it in a lot of a lot of different directions, as we've seen so far with well, the Papa. <laughs> if you take, like, the, the typical, like, prototypical hero, just like, I'm valiant and I'm honor, they're pretty boring, I think. Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, you're the good guy, we get it, you're going to save the day. Uh, but, like, to really, what, who really adds the spin, I think, is... The antagonist to that, like yeah. they're trying to do something different, uh, usually evil, but you know, takes on many forms. So that's what's defining the story, and that's more interesting, I think, than just some guy who's got really high morals. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it certainly worked for Walter White in Breaking Bad. There was something really interesting about <laughs> following the anti-hero instead of the hero, because you never know what choices they're going to make and and who they're going to hurt in the process which also right. creates more stories. Yeah. Was there a monster that particularly uh, haunted you when you were a child? Ooh. Hmm. Was I haunted by any? Um, I don't know if I was like particularly scared or anything. Like I always knew all monsters were just stories. Um, well, any that stand out in particular? Um, of course not, I'm just drawing a blank on every story I've ever read. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just I just like the whole the whole cast. I suppose like Halloween was always my favorite. Oh holiday. yeah, it's fun. Uh, so just always had a, a taste for the dark and spooky flavors. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I like the intelligent ones that are thinking a few steps ahead. Um, yeah, of, they've got a whole their own plan, their own. Uh, 
view. They're not just one dimensional. I'm gonna break things. Like they, There's something fun about a, a villain that's playing chess and is always kind of one step ahead. Like I, I watch a lot of like cop movies or shows where they're kind of like fighting a serial killer, and the serial killer is always like just two little steps ahead. It's like ah, oh, dang, missed him again. <laughs> something interesting about that. Um, and uh, speaking of monsters, in this story, the monster, or I guess we'll call him the monster, is the, the pawpaw, which is made up of fur and hidden hands. It doesn't really seem to have a face or eyes so far, as far as the description goes. So you can kind of interpret that as being like a type of blind and faceless destruction that comes into this world. Um, so where did the idea for the pawpaw come from? And was it meant to be a metaphor about the nature of destruction? I suppose. I don't, I don't even know if I could call it a metaphor. I think it's just literal destruction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, true. It's, it's blind and it destroys things. Uh, so, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't. I, I can't place what inspired it, uh, but I needed. I know I needed that antithesis to the the hero of the story. I needed some some sort of trouble in there. It's like, all right, it's, here's a destructive power. Um, but, like I said, I didn't want the uh, the monster to just be whoops, incredibly one-dimensional. I mean, maybe the pop is one-dimensional. <laughs> you, you can look, it's, it's not that complex of a creature. It runs yeah. around and turns up things. But uh, it does create life wherever it goes. It plants pop or that's yeah, it's that kind of duality you're talking about of like an edible little fruit. Um, so there's some good that comes of it. It's like it's not completely horrible, but like, is it is, is it really worth the trade off? Uh, probably not if it just burst through your home, yeah, and some pop and dipped out. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and another kind of interesting thing about the pawpaw, because it's just so chaotic, that there's all of these other characters, like the the monkeys, who would, or Rakpa, who might not be best friends with Kelrish, but because they all have to face the pawpaw, they band together, and it's like, they might have been enemies in another scenario, but because they have to fight the big boss, they have to, like, band together to do it, which is another... Exactly. Yeah. 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 Get a bigger enemy, and suddenly... The whole mountain's got to band together, at least in some capacity. Yeah, and then once that's done, they can go back to hating each other or whatever was happening before. But <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of the jungle, you're you're quite the adventurer. You've been all over the place. You have been to the jungle before and kind of adventured there by yourself. How much did that influence uh, how you wrote this story and having it set in a jungle? So that influenced it exactly zero <laughs> percent nice. uh, because I hadn't actually visited the jungle prior to writing the story. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, and the same can be said for some of the other stories. Uh, there's one, The Lost Coast. Uh, I wrote that before ever having been to The Lost Coast. Uh, I find in my head anyway, like I get excited for things and I have all these pictures and imagination going on about what I think it might be. And that's really exciting, cause, like, I'll amp for a trip or whatever. So uh, it really sparks the creative process, and it's like, yeah, I could draw off reality, and sometimes I do, and sometimes it's great, it makes it more realistic, I guess. Uh, but I get more excited about my imagination, <laughs> Yeah, it's more inspiring to me to write off of that than off actual life experience so um yeah so the like none of this jungle is based in reality uh, i okay. mean i've watched tv shows and stuff about the jungle so you've but, seen it and i guess the flip side of that is now having written this and having gone to the jungle is there anything you wish you could add now or you would have changed or anything that is more exciting in your jungle than was exciting in the real jungle i guess hmm. i if i wanted to make it a little more realistic, uh, I probably would have added a lot more bugs. I was gonna say, that seems <laughs> to be the main thing missing. It could be another antagonist. <laughs> the yeah, mosquitoes. Yeah. Endless swarms. Yeah. yeah. Very good. But yeah, just the sheer variety of number. I don't even think I could, uh, I could do justice to that in, in a short story and just be listing bugs. 
their descriptions for 20 pages. Just pages and pages of all the bites Kilrish has and how she's got to itch them. <laughs> It'd be yeah. riveting. What plants she uses to saddle them. There you go, yeah. You could, you could, you could create some drama in that if she accidentally puts some gluck gluck root on there, she could be in a big, big trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, did the floor director have any questions? I think that's that's all I've got. Um, so, Sean, are you ready to continue reading *Girl on the Mountain*? <laughs> I suppose I am. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just to catch up the reader or the listener who. Either listened last time and kind of forgot or didn't listen at all. Um, Girl on the Mountain, we start with a magical mountain. The pawpaw, this creature from afar, bumbles in, to turning them up the, the mountainside, destroying everything in its path in its wake that leads these pawpaws. Well, none of the creatures like this, it sets Kalrish of the Wilders off on a chase after the pawpaw to stop it from destroying her den. Also gets Rockpaw the ancient mountain leopard involved when the papa destroys or his, uh, the tree he lives in and his only friend that said tree. Uh, so they're both hunting him independently. They go through the gauntlet of the mountain, which is this crack that goes straight through the heart of the mountain. Uh, Kelrish eventually wanders into the two-faced monkeys where they talk for a while, she almost gets eaten by them, and then uh, they eventually strike a deal uh, where they are going to team up and use the red flower to kill the pop Uh So she has just left the two-faced monkeys. They've ran off in one direction to set the stage, the trap that she will lead the pop into. Uh, and she goes forward in direct pursuit of the pop All right. <clears throat> And she is just upon the many mud pits of uh, the, the mountain. Stretching from wall to wall beneath a ceiling of cloud, the many mud pit extended a significant ways down the canyon. Its aroma was intoxicating, enticing even. Kellerish knew better than to wade through or swim if she could, across if she could. She had never tried to swim in mud th- through, to swim through mud before. The monkey's warning gave her the impression it was best to avoid the mud altogether. Still, the strange temptation lingered, but a lip stirring the pit made that choice less desirable. Or so she told herself. Strolling around along the mud shore and breathing those blissful fumes, Clarice had to focus hard so as not to become lost in a daydream. The air was calm and cool, with the slightest of breezes to lull one perfect relaxation. A curious vine crossed her path, growing out of the mud pit and up the canyon wall. Kalrish took a moment to retrain its tendrils. First, she tried around the rock, next in that crack. Finally, she decided the perfect place to weave it, and with a nod, strolled up. Not quite halfway out, the mud pit pursed its lips, and Kalrish was forced to climb a few body lengths up the wall. The climb itself was simple, fun even. With childlike indifference, she rolled a loose rock along the bottom of her foot while lifting herself up to a ledge. The rock clattered down the wall and was swallowed with a satisfying thwunk and a bubble. Then the mud began to stir. Kilrish sat on the ledge, staring calm, calm, staring through calm curiosity like a fearless, lucid drunk. With an elegant grace, two enormous green pillars twisted out of the mud below, hardly splashing a drop as they shot into the air. Playing methodically, mud streamed off the sleeks, their sleek stems, revealing on each a face patterned in scales. They continued the dance until their faces were clean, and then made a few more passes for their own entertainment and Kelrishes. Eventually, they settled on her wearing the devilish smiles of predators who like to play with their food. Hello, Kelrish began, knowing she had another game to play before she was on her way. Hello, came the response from the taller serpent. What do we have here today? A wilder, the other chimed in. 
How delightful! How delightful indeed, the first concurred, now swaying, swaying lower than its companion. My name is Kalrish, of the Wilders. So nice to make your acquaintance. Ooh, squeaked the second. So polite, this one. We are brothers Vritra and Vala. Forgive me, Kalrish countered conversation. But you cannot be the same brothers Vala and Vritra from the days of old. The ones who stole away the world's water? Wait, sorry, what am I saying? The mud scent swirled through her head, apparently mixing up her thoughts, despite feeling keen enough. A tinge of panic pierced through her, and she realized she could no longer trust her confidence in mind. Focusing so as not to break the rhythm of her speech, she spoke up. You, Fritra, would have to be way bigger. And Vala was a cave, and they were both slain if the whole story holds true. Ah, breathed Fritra, our reputations precede us. We are indeed, continued Vala, though now we take on more modest forms. Spirits such as us. Do not simply vanish, child, explained Vritra. One day we may be so great again, but today we rest and play. Then it is an honor to meet such spirits as yourselves, Kalrish replied, infinitely relieved that her flow of consciousness had not deceived her. Though I must admit, I am glad to see the water back on this earth, he added giving Vritra a sly look. Ha! laughed Vritra. I suppose you would. Kawa has still not forgiven me for that. Don't tell us, child, Vala interjected. What is it that brings you to us today? I am chasing the Papa of Jabra, Kalrish stated matter-of-factly. I wish to kill it before it destroys my home. You seek the filthy mutt who left so many hairs in us, pool, questioned Vala. Noble, perhaps, but you are no match for such an adversary. Besides, yawned Ritra, this papa has stirred up so many snacks for us just this morning. I quite like its presence. How do you plan to destroy this adversary? asked Vala. With the red flower, answered Kalrish. Nasty business, said Vala. It just might work. Kalrish smiled in return. I am still not convinced, Vitra scrutinized as he rolled around his brother. Here is one more snack the papa has driven to us. Why not enjoy it? But I am enjoying it, exclaimed Vala. This is fun, though I wouldn't mind some dessert after our conversation, he added, looking at Kalrish. She knew her odds against these two great serpents, even in their weak forms. The mud scent staved off any inhibition, however. What happened next seemed hardly to matter. How would you do it? she asked through a stiff, stood through a slight slur. If you were me, how would you kill the papa? The serpents looked at each other and laughed. She is fun, agreed Ritra. Your red flower might do, but it is messy, messy. You could kill all our snacks if you let it slip. I would take on a greater form than that silly little Ati Bella offered. Then face the papa myself. Easy for you to say, serpent, Kalrish answered, unsatisfied. But I am no shapeshifter, nor do I have time for reincarnation. The serpents laughed at her remark. How oh, simple minded creatures are who have only no one form consciously. There are many ways to be born in you. 
greater than us even. You don't even have you don't even have to go far, chimed in Rifra, and the pair cackled delightedly. Go on then, trotted Telrish. If I'm to be dessert, at least fill me with a succulent secret first. Ooh, nosy, nosy. <laughs> I think we should. Secrets are too fun not to share, if only with a meal. The pair, who had until now been wriggling and twisting about, settled in close, like a child about to share the bad word they had just learned. Their tones gained a cool hush, but lost little in actual knowledge. Vala began. Beneath this mud lies the heart of the mountain. The legends speak of a spirit chamber. The strongest spirit within is said to bind with the mountain. The mountain becomes an extension of that spirit. Its new form, one might say. And why haven't either of you entered this chamber? Questioned Talrish. There must be some allure to such a form. There are days I miss my old form, spoke Bala, and lust after such magnificence. It is not to be, however. We cannot swim so deep. It is forbidden to us. Call it part of the deal when we took these forms. No trust after our previous infraction. That is one juicy secret to be sure, agreed Calrish. An honor to have heard such a thing before losing this body. Please, that is too good, far too good. Let me repay you and first, and then you may have your meal. I must. Calrish had almost entirely forgotten the task at hand by now. That mattered little, however, for it seemed the serpents would never allow her to leave. And she was drunk on the whole situation. He had one last trick, however, and was now delighted to attempt it. A gift to finish off this meeting, chuckled Mala. I can't remember a better meal in ages, puny as she may be. How is it you wish to repay us, child? My apologies, Fritra, but you've caught me unprepared. I can only offer valor with this gift. Ah, uh, huffed Ritra. I suppose I cannot expect more. Vala? What is it, dear child? pressed Vala. I wish to give you your original form, that of a king. The servants met eyes and laughed heartily yet again. How refreshing! burst Vala. How exciting! Truly, I'm tickled. You are an endless delight, child, really. What do you say, bewildered Tice? May I give you this as my last deed in life? Al looked at Calrish and smiled. I think you must. It would be a shame to lose such a vivacity before it's spent. Calrish took off her pouch and removed her knife from its shoe. Back turned to the serpents. She first placed the flat of her knife on the outside of her pouch. Using the side of her fist, she smashed the knife down onto the pouch several times, moving the knife with each blow. Clarice waited several moments, then opened the pouch as slight as she could and began to mince its contents. After a minute or so of preparation, she replaced her knife and turned back to the servants. Ritra, she beckoned, can I step atop your head to get a better view of Bala? I need to sprinkle this across his whole form. I suppose I could oblige. And Vala, Hilary Stern, would you be so kind as to imitate the form you wish to take? This makes for an easier transformation, do you see? Of course, came the response, and Vala began to coil an arch atop the mud surface, in what roughly resembled a cake. Meanwhile, Kalrish stepped atop Ritra and told him to sweep over his, brody, his bro brother once she began to pour him out. If this feels at all uncomfortable, Kalrish explained, then dip beneath the mud for relief, but only after you've been fully covered. Ready? 
Ooh, yes, spouted the eager Mala. Okay, now. Hilary sprinkled her pouch as evenly as possible across Vala, while Rich returned. The whole thing happened in an instant. Vala started to hiss through a grimace, but before he could object, the bag had been empty. Immediately, his skin began to dry and trickle. Richard lost humor quickly as Vala started to sink, his cave-like form stiffening as he went. Without hesitation, Kalrish unsheathed her knife and stabbed beneath her crouch into Richard's eye. It instantly began to shrivel from the residual blood blood powder. Continuing her static motion, she rolled forward off of Richard's head, pulling the knife out as she fell. He snapped upward in pain, just missing Kalrish's foot as she dove into Bubble and emerged, and the mud grew angry. It sputtered and crackled, quickly turning to rock and adhering to the serpent. Flourish lost no time in finding her way beneath the sinker. It didn't take long for her knife to drag her down, accelerating to the accumulated weight. Another moment, and she left it to find the bottom, while making for cover under the newly formed cave. Kalrish was immediately struck by the sealant, but managed to keep from being too shaky. An air pocket gave her some relief from the ordeal, but it was small. After a breath, she was jarred again by the emergence of snapping jaws, faintly illuminated by a massive, glistening eye. Hauntingly, the serpent's eyes glowed in the absence of light. The attacker took a blow from the fallen cave, but kept up his intensity nonetheless. Bracing against the wall, she kicked forward with all her might. The serpent hardly recoiled and lashed forward again, forcing Kalrish to dodge sideways. Timing her next strike to when, Val- to when Britra rebounded, she kicked again, full strength, at the dimmer of the two lights. Whether luck or skill, she landed a direct bull blow to his punctured eye. Carrying her weight through, Kalrish just barely managed to push the wounded creature from her. The cave sunk out without great breath. As for Bala, he was shriveled to the spine, cased in stone. His belly and chin still showed, but the great snake was hardly more than a fossil at this point. Truly more cave than serpent, he was not about to mulch this new skin. Down they sank, pressure built, and Kalrish's ears started screaming. She felt as if her head were ready to explode. Farther, farther, she plunged. Only gradually did it begin to slow. They nicked one of the canyon walls, and moments later bashed into another. She was worried Val would flip, but somehow they maintained their orientation. The momentum steadied, and with one last bump, the cave ground to a halt. Hilarish peeled herself from the wall and timidly found her footing beneath the mud. First, she gathered her head. Her skull was screaming, about to pop from the pressure. It was all she could do not to slip on me. The air pocket had shrunk considerably, and Hilarish stretched to keep her a pathway for her breath to reach her lungs. Distant booms and echoes grew muted. The silence billowed to totality. Clarice felt fully the black which ensconced her. That thick, wet darkness was sobering, to be sure. Her heart, already churning from the descent, raced on faster than it could be at the thought of her dark predicament. More than anything, she wished for a light, an ember by which to glimpse the shadow of Valley's belly. She hadn't noticed the serpent's luminous eyes until Vritra had made met her in the cave, but she imagined Valas shone out like two tiny beacons, quickly absorbed in the They certainly lent no light to his inside anyway. When at last she settled her heart and her head through systematic breathing, Kalrish took what took what notes she could of her surroundings. Feeling along the smooth snake belly wall, her first note was the thin layer of rock that coated her hands. She must have gotten some powder on them, after all. Her sense of touch was dimmed, but that hardly seemed to matter now. A muffled whimper caused her to cringe in paranoid fear. 
Alec cried above, and Kaurish figured she must be near his head. It pained her a little, what she had done to Vala, and even to Vritra. Despite their insistence on eating her, they had made for enjoyable company. It seemed a shame to imprison one so. Still, she remembered the ancient crimes and wondered how long one ought to be punished for stealing all of the world's water. Pretty long, was the answer she eventually landed on, and continued her shuffling. Toward the back of the cave, Bella's tail slowed down, and eventually all headspace disappeared. Kalrish held her breath and felt about it had felt about here with her feet. A few shuffles on, and she slipped. It was not a jarring slip. In fact, it was the slowest slip she had ever experienced. Mud cushioned the fall until the, her bottom met rock, but her legs kept falling. A strange sensation of vertigo overtook her. She was tempted, tempted to liken the sensation to the deep hole sucking her down. But that wouldn't have been right. Her leg fell, and she knew she had to fall with it or drown in the mud where she sat. With an awkward sh shove, she began to move a weighty rock cover in the hole. Then shifted and settled even snugger around her leg. Remarkably, the sensation of her falling toes kept her from panicking. She repositioned herself, scraping her pinched leg through the twist. Bracing the other foot against a rock for an uncomfortable purchase, she heaved forward flipping the rock away and leaving her body to rest on the lip of the sea. Not lingering long, Kalrish allowed herself to slip below to a gentle free fall. Floated, she fell. Her body moved on, but her mind stayed put. Or did her mind continue on, leaving the body behind? The sensation was surreal, as if the sand of her being drifted out in every direction was stretching her conscience, but never diminishing. Her essence stayed true to its concentration, but multiplied by the mud in which it mingled. Kalrish lightened to nothing, but expanded to all. Sight was meaningless now, as were sound and touch. New senses crept over the old. They were more subtle, more grand. She breathed in with a million trees, but the flesh of her rivers and the resistance of her of the beaver dance that slowed them. Rich, rotten carcasses were the desserts that dotted her terrainous tongue, flavored by the funguses that decomposed them. About her, within her, truly, as a part of her, she felt the swarms of spirits which occupied the mountain. They were their own spirits, absolutely, but she was something bigger. She was the puzzle into which they fit, the frame to their divine scene the self they were most a part of, but often least aware of. Kalrish had become the mountain. Then she felt a small kick. Suddenly, Kalrish was aware of another presence. Her existence became crowded. Their consciousnesses circled, each sniffing the other out. They met with a clash. Kalrish hit hard, and the other rebounded far. But her adversary had a curious touch. More accustomed to the powers, they swam. He was left feeling funny. Attempting to grapple the other proved useless. It slipped effortlessly for each grasp. Another funny jab came her way. Not a powerful one, but poisonous, perhaps? She could not place her opponent's effect, and was not about to pause for another demonstration either. The exchanges made it clear that size was on her side, if size even still made sense though the other was far more comfortable in this environment. Not wanting to learn any of its tricks, she swore beneath her companion and released her mind, her might upward toward her physical exit of valor. The other tumbled in the flush, churning to stay put, reaching, grabbing, finding Kalrish, who yanked away and swirled ahead. The final, fixating push, the other was flung from Kalrish's new domain in a whirl of mud. Bala felt a rumble brooding with deep within, and spewed from his cave mouth. At the surface, Fritra romped about, releasing the pain from his injured eye through wild movement, grappling with his brother's fate, 
all the while. Belching bubbles managed to catch his unfocused attention. A small uprush of mud proceeded, and in its wake, a frog spouted up into the sunlight. Richard regarded the speck for a moment, then turned back to riding. The frog swam to shore, shook off its mud, and hopped away into the gauntlet. In the meantime, Rockpop, who had taken his time in the safety of the maze, now limped his way to the thick of the steam up. He knew all advantage was lost. The haze here left him blind with the pop off. His venue offered little for Rockpop, but it is bad but his battered state told him he would have to do for a last stand. Venturing forward, he navigated the unseen cracks and boulders with hardly a misstep. Looking back, the tip, of, the tip of his tail danced flirtatiously on the head of the man. He took easy comfort in the blanket of fog that shrouded his form. Instincts told him that he was hidden, but he knew the pawpaw did not rely on his sight. Perhaps the vapors were thick enough to stifle his scent. Perhaps not. The pawpaw landed with a thud on all sides of rock pop, knocking him down. After the initial grace, Paws began feeding down randomly, thoroughly. Rockpaw shrank initially, then scuttled, then rolled. He was jumping and shifting, anything to dodge the hailstorm above. One paw caught his tail, but reflexively lifted, and another blow was struck. During that involuntary twitch, Rockpaw yanked his flattened fluff away, not waiting for the foot to settle again. The paws came down and sink with just enough space between them. Rapa took the opening, dashed out, trying to ignore the leg muscle that tore in the scramble. The leopard flung his body behind a rock, chest heaving as he rolled forward, trying to contain a flailing leg. Inching ahead, he gasped for breath and steadied his nerve. With one final effort, Rapa leapt atop the next boulder, which sat carefully on a stone perch. He had the strength to pull off what was taken. Though this trap was something he had always wanted to try. Presented now on a pedestal, he paused and sensed, dealing out with his mind. He didn't sense long, but the papa was on him immediately. Timing it down to the last hair's distance, Rock Pop kicked back off the boulder with all his strength, trying desperately not to break his leg in the process. There was his flaw. The bad leg slipped. Rockpop floundered forward. He made some distance. The boulder even rocked, but he knew it was only it was would only settle back in place. Being the cat he was, Rockpop twisted midair to view the last misplaced move he would make. He saw the slightest heater, accentuated by a squirt of steam issued from beneath the boulder. Just as the steam stream narrowed to a close, the pawpaw lay directly above. A burst of energy shot forth, rocketing the boulder straight into the pawpaw's gut. Rockpaw could not believe his eyes. His plan was to scald the great beast with boiling steam, not befit it with a boulder. Now the feline was truly blind with his fresh spout of steam escaping into the atmosphere. The pawpaw appeared to be stunned by the blow, but he wasn't about to saunter up and find out. Rockpaw howled on desperately creating all the space he could between himself and the pawpaw. The fortuitous blow gave Rockpaw a few minutes to limp. He tried finding a ledge, but gave up on that idea after a few attempts. His busted leg could barely carry him forward. Up was out of the question. Behind him came the clatter of Rockfall, followed by a satisfying groan. The magic guided him now, and he would take all the aid he could offer. Hari struggled with her new body. She was learning to walk all over again. The real issue was figuring out what she could sense versus what she could control. Practicing across the mountain helped to quicken the process, but only so much. She found letting loose rock fall was something like itching dead skin. Controlling the rivers was akin to controlling her blood flow, possible through meditation, but only to such a degree. The steam vents, on the other hand, felt right. Just blow where you will and as hard as you want. 
For a touch of fell in full on the battle amidst those deep nights. Hilarish sensed the critters as they crossed her skin, acting with instinctual time. Rock hit the pawpaw, causing one of its armored studs to crack. The beast stumbled forward, rumbled. Further on, she tried the same move, only this time with fresher rock in a key to her location. The rock slid off with a grinding pop and fell like a few, like a few deep hairs and ripped from her scalp. Projectiles volleyed down on the pawpaw like an avalanche, and it was pinned by a pile of stone. Then Kelrich tried her boldest move yet. Flora opened a crack beneath the pawpaw, pushed hot steam from it with all her might. The act was excruciating on all of that. Kelrich felt as if she cut herself and dumped citrus into the wound. The pawpaw howled and cried. Even Rockpaw was struck by the heat. Gushing steam cooked the beast alive, pressing it from below into the rocks above. The Papa squirmed and writhed. Using the steam draft to its advantage, the Papa shoved itself up before dropping its shoulder to let Rock fall away. Rolling itself, the Papa barely managed to escape the cracked clutches and rolled another two body lengths further before coming to a stop, twitching uncontrolled. Now, the pop all lay its newly acquired rock armor was crumpled, dangling from loose, wet hairs. It cared not for vengeance on rock pop, but for anything else. Minutes went by, then tens of minutes. Rock pop shuffled on after pursuing the beast of great winters, but eventually settled behind the rock to rest. The pop paw was as broken as he could. When at last the pop paw got up, it turned to leave the way it came. Rakha cared little what happened to the beast now. His fight was over. He had done all he could. Alrish, on the other hand, had a job to finish. She couldn't allow the Papa back the way it came. It might find its way to the other side of the mountain if she wasn't careful. She didn't like her options, but there was little choice left. The Papa passed by an odd pillar. Alrish snapped it like a finger, bringing it down on the beast dashed ahead awkwardly, just quickly enough to avoid more than a minute. Hellrish was running out of options. Taking the mountain's equivalent of a deep breath, she mustered her courage. Before the pawpaw, a chasm opened up, clear across the canyon. It widened by the second, spewing angry steam into the sky as it crept closer to the beast's position. Rock tumbled in, heat tumbled out. The pawpaw was left no choice. He turned round sullenly and marched back in the direction of the rock pile. Meanwhile, Kalarish was screaming, her voice present in the fierce steam's whistle. She held out as long as possible before closing the gash she'd inflicted upon herself. A wide trench remained, a great scar commemorating the great battle. He hoped it was the last scar her mountain would receive during the Papa's time. Papa patted on sourly. When it came to pass Rockpa again, the brute made a lame kick at the catcher at the hiding spot. The rock around Rockpa held fast, and the Papa wasn't about to spend the energy to get through. With the parting kick, the Papa kept on. Meanwhile, the two faced monkeys were busy working their end of the bargain. They swung this way and that, vaulting from stock to stock through the bamboo road. Others scoured the ground for materials, scampering about in a hectic fury. They culminated around a heap where dried mosses and sticks piled together. Digging around the pyre to be, other monkeys constructed a dirt perimeter, though it looked less than practical. Three distant, high pitched cries sounded through the blade. Pop off, Harish, however, was nowhere to be seen. The monkeys were anxious. Without Kalrish, their whole plan was for naught. Had the Papa done away with her? Did she simply run away? They began to question their hastily made answers. Kalrish, of course, sensed the nest that they had fluffed up in her bamboo. She knew she was capable of fulfilling the plan, but the exact mechanism for doing so was fuzzy. Feeling out 
to some of her new entities of herself. Kalrish fired a signal through her nerves. The sky darkened, maybe too fast. Kalrish eased up, felt her body reject the command. It tugged on the heavens before being properly produced. Balwan, recalcitrant spirit of the sky, was offended by this blatant movement. The papa, at last, met with bamboo, less tenacious this time around, who took care and Shifting itself through the sieve, the papa slowly trotted forward, and then it was stuck. It wore this day's trials plainly. Exhausted, the creature first leaned on the bamboo as a crutch, before even attempting to win. This was Kalrish's chance, but she may have already triggered the wrong reaction from her body. Desperately, she tried to backtrack, to appease the intractable sky spirit and make hasty amends. That was too late now, she found, and the papa was already pressing forward once again. The sky grew heavy and black, angry at the mountain that lay below it. Elrish had no choice. She overrode her mutinous limbs, bullying them into, into submission the spirits that guided them. It felt as if she were holding up the entire sky, holding a sky that itself held in an ocean. If the heavens opened up, there'd be no telling what would become of Twisting an arm, Longan, the cloud spirit, let out a grumble. Lightning shot down into the grove with cruel, forced accuracy. The pawpaw jumped, sticking itself with a spike cluster. Behind the beast, orange tendrils trickled through the monkey's pile before blooming into a coherent flame. The red flower quickly established itself among the moss, invading all accompanying wood until it too was a light. Not in smoke, the papa struggled. At first, this only tightened its snare, but eventually it broke free. The heat was noticeable now. The papa panicked. Frantically, it pushed this way and that, catching spikes and tearing hair tufts. Again, the creature was snagged, flames crept in. Now they were upon it. But the papa didn't catch fire. After a few moments of violent squirming, it became evident why the pawpaw wasn't burning. Steam began to waft off the soggy beast, and then it began to billow. The pawpaw had had enough. Being roasted alive twice in one day was enough to drive any creature to desperation. Surrounded now by dancing red flower, the pawpaw heaved recklessly. A massive chunk of its shoulder was left behind as the beast made a dash from the flame. Her tips began to singe, flaming bamboo spikes tangled into its rock crumbled coat. The grove was engulfed. Flames blew past the dirt ring of leaves, unhindered by the hastily formed barrier. The papa was ravenous. It was mad, a creature cornered with only one good bite left. Breaking free of the grove and now burning quite handily, the papa flailed about the gauntlet's It met the great tree. Yeah, with a bash. Again, the creature bashed, and again, throwing itself wildly against the trunk as if it were a plausible means to smother the flames. Irish ached to let the flood to let go of the floodgates. Did not risk saving the papa. It was all she could do to hold the skies and stand still and walk. The great tree groaned. It could take no more. With a final blow, the great tree snapped unnaturally. The trunk broke completely through, and the papa was carried forward under its own momentum. Its belly caught the jagged tree's great base. This acted like a lever, and as the flaming papa fell forward and down, Yah's roots were brought up as if they'd rotted out years ago. The rest of the great tree slid unnaturally, landing flat over the papa crushing the beast between the tree Yah's halves. The papa twitched in its skewered sandwich. What came next was even more re remarkable than the giant tree crumbling like a pump wood. From the papa, the tree Yah, so full of life and greenery just that morning, caught fire like kindling, erupting to, un to uncontrollable flames in seconds. 
several lingering moments passed. An odd calmness fixated around the set of the sea, centered on frantic flames which could not seem to devour the great tree fast enough. Finally, the jungle blinked, and a torrent of rain befell the mountain. Still the great tree burned until it was nothing but ash, the water drops failing to have any effect on the fire. The rest of the grove's flames subsided, leaving a large portion of bamboo spikes significantly trimmed back. When the rain stopped, the monkeys gathered in the puddles around the fallen tree ya, or rather, around what remained. From wet ashes, a single stalk blossomed toward the sky. Soaking in the, se soaking in the sacrificial substrate around it, the sapling grew before their very eyes. The monkeys understood Yaz martyrdom. They also understood the Papa's desire to be free from his homeland. In memoriam of both the great tree and the misguided creature's final battle, they decided to name the reborn being Father Era, Papa Yah. The papaya grew three monkeys high that day. They moved the rest of the ash to its base, and within a week, one monkey could hang from a branch without fear of it snapping. Rapa limped out from the grove two days after the storm. At first, he was furious, nearly killing the monkey unfortunate enough to be tending to the papaya. When the, ta when the tale was recounted, Rapa calmed considerably. He resented the papaya both more and less. It was part Papa and the direct effect of his only friend's death. But it was also part Ya, looking hard on the fresh on the fresh life that devoured his friend's ashes. Rakha turned and retreated into the gauntlet. Eventually, he spoke with the one-eyed Vidra, who elucidated the details leading up to the Papa's demise. Rakha resolved to blame Kelrich, the mountain for the burning of his friend, Yah. From then on, he would scratch hard in the dirt or on rock, sharpening his claws, hoping to bring Kelrich more pain. He felt the itch, but was pained more by his grief than his actions. As for her, she stayed in the mountain, trapped as much as she was free. Vidra would never let her live if she passed through the mud pits. He kept a restless guard. Balwan and Longan, sky and cloud, never fully forgave Kelrish for their rude introduction. In turn, the mountain's weather became particularly unpredictable. Kelrish elected never to control them again, though she did influence them from time to time once she gained the subtleties of her new form. Moons passed and Rakpa healed, eventually sharing with the monkeys Kelrish's fate. They, in turn, traveled across the mountain and recounted all as best they could to the Wilders. A friendship was born between the two peoples, though the Wilders never did share their full knowledge of the Red Flower with the monkeys. Rakpa rarely returned to the papaya. That spot was no longer home to him. He traveled the mountain for years, terrorizing its denizens before settling in a cave that straddled the great, the great, the great tree line. The two-faced monkeys cared for the papaya and, in time, took sanctuary among its branches. The fruit they produced dwarfed that of any of the, of the papas. Kalrish meddled less and less in any individual affairs. She, of course, had some bias toward the wilders, but found it best that the best harmony was kept when she strove only to maintain a healthy body. She allowed the spirits of her extremities to continue under their own accords, going only as far as to set the mood on any given day. This served just as well to guide them and led them led to a far more cooperative environment. Her individuals should remain as such as they thought, or she would surely be the death of the mountain in all its majesty. Thus, the mountain lived in rich wonder, shrouded in strong magic, until at last, it was met with the pervasive devices of man. That was so good. <laughs>
I love that. There's so much drama at the end of that story with all the various battles going on and the... I love the, uh, the tricking that Kelrish has to do with the, the two snakes. It's very, <laughs> very, very mythical, that scene. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Plays some of the, uh, the fumes uh, against them, which relaxing and calm to her, kind of uh, disorienting, but they've been getting high off those fumes for <laughs> years and years, it seems, so maybe they, uh, they've lost a step. They're, they're used to that particular bowl, strain. Bowl over on them. Yeah. Oh, that was so great. Well, thanks again for joining us, Sean. It's so fun having you on uh, to read these yeah. stories. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us as well. We'll be back next Wednesday at noon Pacific time to keep reading from Finding the Lost. And if you'd like to catch up on any of the earlier episodes, watch the first half of this. If you go to callingcardbooks.com slash power of story time, we have all the videos there and some, uh, some chapters that you can read as well. So Sean website too. Oh yeah. And you can also buy the book or find out more about Sean, read his blog at minsterbooks.com. So definitely check those out and, uh, and join us again next week.